Hello, welcome to Microsoft Ignite. Thanks for joining our talk today. As companies explore moving to the cloud or think about how best to optimize cloud resources for your strategic goals, there are a number of important decisions around how best to build a SaaS architecture that need to be considered. I'm delighted to share one such success story uh, with you today. Through our guest, Ulrich Estrup Hansen, VP and Head of SaaS Innovation at Simcorp. Ulrich, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. So for those of you who don't know Simcorp, Simcorp is often considered the tech, bone, tech backbone of the investment management industry, uh, particularly the buy side. So our clients are the largest uh, insurance company, the largest asset managers, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, and so, uh, those type of clients. There's about 1,500 uh, prospects or clients in that space, and we have about 300 uh, of them. So we offer our software as a service. Um, and in my role in SaaS innovation, I uh, manage the cloud architecture of that uh, security compliance. And then we have about 13 uh, scrum teams of primarily Azure DevOps engineers that focus on uh, providing the right solution, performance, uh, user experience, uh, the right security level at the right price, uh, obviously. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you again for joining us today um, to, to talk uh, first about one of the most important concepts within SaaS architecture. Let's dive into tenancy. Now, as we know, there's a whole spectrum of tenancy models. Uh, at one end, you have fully single tenant applications where each layer of the stack, the application layer, the database layer, infrastructure layer and network layer is dedicated to a single customer. At the other end, you have fully multi-tenant applications where every layer is shared. And then you have some in between that are more hybrids. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you've approached this decision, the pros and the cons for your different applications. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion and something we, we, we talk a, a lot about uh, in our company as well. And uh, we actually have all uh, the models, uh, all hybrid versions we have available. Um, so let's let, I just need to explain a little bit about uh, kind of our architecture. So we do have a number of cloud native applications as well, and we are refactoring part of our core platform. Our core platform is, is our kind of key revenue. It's also a platform where we use uh, we use Silk uh, from a from a storage solution. Right, that is a more classic architecture, traditional, as you know, uh, N-tiered architecture, Oracle database, uh, client, and an application uh, tier layer, etc. Right, for that, uh, our clients typically demand single tenancy. So because they are the largest uh, financial institutions, they also have a preference. So there is no longer a kind of a regular regulatory. Um, inhibitor in, the, in that regard, but many of our clients still demand that they have complete isolation and all their data is in a, a single tenant. So that is our base offer. Now to that, I should add that many of them use our platform from a multi-tenant perspective. So they will offer uh, their services um, to a number of their clients, which then become tenants. And for that, we have uh, two flavors as well. So we have a flavor where in, in, in terms of a database uh, container, they're shared within uh, one database, one pluggable database. Uh, and then you can have a more segregated scenario still in the same container, but a separate pluggable database, right? So uh, if you look from a, from a cost perspective for that, right, there's obviously implications. Um, the, the tenancy model where you are getting more segregation uh, Let's say you have ten tenants. It's twice as expensive from a from a compute perspective, and then obviously there will be some overhead as well from a, from an operations scenario. Sure. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. You you raise such a um, thought provoking topic of not only your architecture but what you present on to your end customers. Um, yet another layer to this strategy that's really important. Um, and it's great that you've been able to structure it um, to support the needs of, of your customers, ensuring that their data is fully separate while giving them options for how they want to serve their end customers. Um, what are some of the decisions that you had to make around scaling and managing resources for your applications? Yeah, so our clients, if we look at, at uh, 
our clients and how they uh, their patterns as such, right? So they're, because they are financial institutions, um, markets typic typically open uh, for them as, as a large player, global player, they open in, in APAC in, in, the, in Australia, Japan, uh, and then they're moving across to kind of when the US markets open as well for our sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East. Sunday is also a trading day as well, right? They have uh, different end of day, uh, end of month loads. In essence, they have processing 24 seven, 365, right? So it, it's one, first of all, building uh, a solution that's available uh, 99, four nines. Uh, second of all, needing to be able to scale with their loads, right? So if they have particular loads in the middle of the day, we need to be able to meet that from an, from an architecture perspective, right? And preferably as elastic as possible, right? Because sizing from a peak perspective can get uh, quite uh, expensive. Um, so what were some of the decisions that went into architecting your application to be able to scale on demand and, and not uh, be at peak at yeah. all times? Yeah. So, so where we, for example, um, scale horizontally with, with these loads is that we needed to make our, our service agents uh, elastic. Um, and then we use, uh, in the case of, we haven't moved them over to Kubernetes yet, but we use um, dynamic scale sets from that perspective. So once their loads start, let's say they have to do high processing on their NAVs as an example, then it can scale out with that load. And once that load is done, we can, we can scale it back in um, from, a, from a cost perspective. You mentioned availability um, and, and making sure, particularly for the type of customers that you serve, that your architecture is resilient um, is critical. Uh, so with your application, particularly the, the main one, how have you designed or, or what are some of the choices that you give your customers around making sure that they are resilient? Yeah, it, it's a good question. It's almost the other way around because the, the demand for, for better resiliency, uh, the regulatory demands as well uh, through the framework, for the global frameworks as such is, is moving that needle quite a bit. So from an RTO perspective, uh, it's, it's uh, zero uh, to near zero at worst uh, that, that they have expectations for. And from an RTO perspective, Contractually, we typically offer around four, but of course that needle is also moving considerably uh, further down. So it has to be a, a very highly resilient. Um, and I would say that the traditional parameters around resiliency, making them highly avail available. And, and, and in case of uh, being able to fail over that, that bar has also moved a little bit into looking at uh, data centers, looking at uh, cloud providers and looking at ransomware. Uh, so the scope is is ever uh, evolving. So if you look at the three scenarios, right, high availability, um, DR, and then we take ransomware as a, as an example afterwards, uh, just to show how how the how that kind of moving right. All the components in in our primary region, if we take Azure as an as an example, are highly resilient, right? So those come also in in three flavors. Either we are using an Azure service where we get the resiliency built in. Uh, to our product, for example, in the case of the, 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 the scale sets, uh, those service agents, um, if it fails, the workloads can move to another agent. So it comes built into our code or we've had to build it ourselves, right? So if you have, for example, running on Kubernetes, if a pod dies, we need to make sure that that workflow is continuing on, on another pod, right? That's happening and typically uh, it's spread between the availability zones within that region. Let's say case number two, we're losing our availability zone. Uh, now we have to fail over. So for that scenario, we always have the data active on the secondary side. And we always use, and I should say always, I uh, shouldn't say that because we, we use it when there is an Azure pair. Uh, then we are using the pair uh, as our secondary side. But of course, now many of the Azure regions um, and AWS, et cetera, Google, when they're opening in countries where all our clients have data residency requirements, uh, they don't necessarily have a pair and they still have the requirement to have the DR side. So it will become an, an, another availability zone. Right? But for that scenario, uh, from DR, we move over to the secondary side. 
the data is always uh, available, synchronized. Uh, but all the other components, the stateless components, uh, we will just redeploy that. So we uh, that becomes part of the DR pipeline. Uh, that uh, once that's pulled, it's will be redeploying, and once the users access that uh, underlying compute required, will be will be redeployed uh, as well. Now for the third element, which is the ransomware, right? Um, and, and from a risk perspective, we have also decided that our backups are hosted externally to our primary cloud provider. So in the case of Azure, we are using uh, OCI from a backup perspective as a good backup service, uh, good uh, APIs. Uh, and it also allows us to have less dependency uh, to our provider. So in the case of ransomware, or there's issues with that, we have our data uh, air gap on the on OCI, uh, and then our inventory in our Cosmos inventory, the metadata is available there as well, spread across regions. So we're able to use and rebuild uh, our tenants elsewhere. So if we can build it in another uh, region, or if that region is available, or we no longer trust that subscription from a ransomware perspective, we're able to to rebuild that uh, as well. So the resiliency aspects uh, and the requirements are ever increasing. Uh, and obviously our focus from an engineering perspective is, is keep, keep automating everything as much as you can and keep uh, looking to optimize that automation. That's great. It's, it's clear you've taken a impressively mature approach to handling these modern challenges, both for availability and protection from cyber threats. So to the uh, ever present subject of cost. Uh, we talked about a whole bunch of trade-offs here that every organization needs to consider based on their business model, based on their customer base and their requirements when building out their SaaS architecture. To that end, what uh, are some of the tools that you use or how do you think about um, managing and monitoring your cloud resources, uh, particularly when making trade-offs such as Okay, we, we want to make sure our costs stay low, but also in an incident, want to make sure we're the first to grab those resources uh, if everyone's scrambling to fail over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting, I think almost all enterprises and everyone moving to the cloud, uh, particularly in the beginning and year one and year two, uh, FinOps or, or cost management uh, around your resourcing and, and your growth, it becomes a key issue. Um, moving to the cloud uh, is, is the first step, but then kind of getting control and user lighting the crowd is, uh, is step two. And I'm not necessarily a big fan of massive FinOps uh, organizations, um, but I am a big fan of uh, accountability, right? And, and you need to instill accountability. So if I split it up in terms of, you will always have, in our case, internal cost, um, we will have development cost, you will have internal IT, et cetera. And then for us as a SaaS company, we have all our external costs, right? Which is the largest uh, footprint um, on the cloud. For that, you need uh, internally, I make my POs responsible. Uh, they're accountable. How they spend that budget, I'm, I'm, that's, that's their business, but they need to be accountable. Uh, and on the client side, we meet regular, regularly with the architects, uh, doing deep dives. Not a month passes where we're not checking uh, on all the individual uh, client subscriptions. What happened here? Did somebody put some log analytics uh, on, on a certain area, et cetera? There is a lot of money to be saved uh, with that discipline, uh, apart from normal right sizing and, and normal capacity management. And then we also use third-party services. So there is a value in using some of these services that have AI tools. Uh, some of them can look across your different cloud providers, uh, look to optimize how you use reservations uh, as, a, as an example is, is uh, one area that we're also, also utilizing um, to, to raise that game for us. Yeah, um, that's great. Uh, and, and so in terms of streamlining some of the, the costs, clearly that increased ownership within your organization has helped, the third party intelligence has helped. Um, have you used much to actually monitor or alert on costs and, and use that to inform where you want to spend resources to optimize? 
Yeah, so the trigger, so in terms of, we try to, of course, make it at, as intelligent uh, as possible and, and the services as well, right? Instead of being reactive and proactive, but step one to make it kind of uh, proactive is the reactive element, right? So we have a lot of uh, events and, and alerts uh, on on the, on our different subscriptions and our different components. So that is also a very massive investment uh, as such that that we have right so a lot of things are provided by uh, the cloud providers that make it available and using their apis etc but when it comes to your application it becomes very specific to that application and the providers that are in the market they don't really they don't really kind of offer that they offer a framework uh, or you can build in Grafana your own kind of uh, monitoring framework and then you, you can build specifically into your applications right but it the core of the kind of cost growth is coming from these applications and that's really what you need to monitor tightly how they are how they're used right and in our case they're tied to contracts to to our clients right so in our uh, cloud UI um, we we make those metrics available, right? So it's visible for them. Well, how many transactions are you processing? How many positions are you processing? Any of these? How many users access the platform? What did they do? Uh, because you also have an explanation from a from a cost reason, similar to me logging into or having my BI reports on from from the Azure portal uh, as an example. They need that transparency uh, as well through the contract. Right? That makes sense. Well, thank you. That's been a, a fantastic deep dive into some of the interesting trade-offs there uh, for your architecture in the cloud. Uh, we hope you found this interesting and gives you added confidence uh, and some interesting information for how you might make your journey to the cloud and build out a SaaS architecture. Thank you and have a great day.